I wanted High Guardian Spice to be good. I wanted it to be good, so, so bad. Because if it was good, that would open the doors for more people who want to express their dreams and concepts through anime to do so in an English-speaking fashion. I also wanted Wish and the Little Mermaid reboot to be good. But unfortunately, they weren't. And they fell into the critics' arsenal of examples to use for Why woke media bad? So this is a video a lot of you really requested. Oh, and don't worry, I will be taking a swing at conservative media eventually, because that is a dumpster fire full of cringe just waiting to be explored. Actually, most of these points can probably also apply to conservative media as well. But right now, since there's a lot more of it, I'm going to tackle the woke media. First of all, we need to answer the question, what is woke? Originally, it meant aware of injustice, but now no one can really define it. Just like no one can really define what hate speech was back in 2016. And now we have two communities of sticks in the mud that are here to ruin all things fun. But as someone who used to frequent conservative circles, I think I've gathered a good definition of what woke, or more specifically, woke media is. For this video, woke is going to mean progressive, so I'll be saying progressive from now on. Okay, but what does progressive mean? I've narrowed it down to four categories that can mostly be smashed into two. Basically, it can be boiled down to diversity and pushing a progressive political message. But first, I'm going to say that having diversity and women in media does not make things political. It's how you use it that does. Diversity seems to be the first thing that people think of when they think of woke. I've seen some polls that some people think just diversity existing in a media makes it woke or bad, and that is very much not true. There are people that think LGBT, or rather just the T, is morally wrong, and that's not going to change with this video, unfortunately. There are also some people that are actually racist and sexist, and that's not who we're going to write for. We are writing for the everyday individual that loves equality and stuff, but hates cringe. So now that we've established what it is, let's get to why it often tends to suck. The biggest reason is that it is very not fleshed out. Often the only reason why this media was created in the first place was for progressivism. Not the story, not the characters, progressivism was the first thing and everything else takes a back seat. And this goes for all political ideologies. That's why even conservatives will say that Lady Ballers was cringe in a terrible movie. You can have an idea to tell a political message first, but you have to realize your setting, characters, world, etc. are just as important as that message. This tends to lead people into thinking that some of these mediums are only greenlit due to connections in Hollywood, which everyday people do not like. Also, this leads to checklist writing, which is what I discussed in my villains video. Checklist writing is basically treating writing as more of a chore, and basically, as you're writing, just wanting to hit all the little points that you have, rather than really devoting yourself to the passion and the art of writing. This is why a lot of these works tend to not have a lot of creativity. Which ties into my next point. This is why the Snow White and the Little Mermaid remakes leave a bad taste in many people's mouths. If you're doing race or gender swapping just to do it, it's going to make some people think that you don't really care and that you just want to make money. An example of Miss Potential would be the Little Mermaid remake. It actually makes some aspect of the film confusing. King Triton and Ariel's sisters, it kind of implies that he has, or had, multiple wives? I mean, I could brush it off because they're like half fish, but what I have a harder time brushing off is the whole Prince Eric adoption thing. So you wanted to cast someone black as the queen, okay? Genetics work in mysterious ways sometimes. Or better yet, why not just make him black? I never thought I'd be asking Disney that question. Now, if Disney were to do what I would have done, it would have been a different story, which is set everything in the Caribbean. Not only does it add to the story, but it expands on the Little Mermaid story and makes things make sense. First, you get Caribbean culture, which is a black culture that isn't African American or African that often gets forgotten about. We get to showcase Caribbean artists, like the artists that I grew up with, like Sean Paul, Sean Kingston. It also finally makes sense why Sebastian sounds Jamaican. And most importantly, it makes sense why there's coral reefs and colorful fish, which do not exist in Denmark or the Mediterranean. 
This allows you to have a much cooler and colorful and vibrant setting. Because it's set in the Caribbean, everyone is black. The mermaids have their own little hairstyles, maybe they have shells in their cornrows. You get to showcase all these unique black hairstyles and give them all a little aquatic twist. But Ariel leaves her hair natural. Ariel is the only one in the original that did not have any hair accessories, so it's a respectful homage to the original. And then when Ariel goes on land, have her be surprised about how her hair looks a lot different. And then the land women give her a makeover, maybe give her the dreads, and she falls in love with human fashion and hair customs and Caribbean musics and food and spices and festivals. That would show us what Ariel loves so much about the land and why she finds it so charming. That's how you expand on Ariel's love for the land outside of the prince. You see how changing the races and the setting actually has an impact on the story and makes it more interesting and even gives it a pop of historical interest? A Caribbean setting would have made it stand out as not just another soulless remake, but a transformative twist. This is what the princess and the frog did. The original story came from Europe, but if they would have set it in a European setting, it would have felt bland and would have blended into the other Disney princess films. Instead, Disney set it in 1920s Louisiana, giving it an amazing transformative twist that everybody loved. That's not to say that their identity isn't a part of who they are, just that they need more than that to be a good character. The biggest way to fix this is to give them motivation. You know me and my love of motivation, everything needs motivation, all of it. Give it motivation! Or give them a relatable issue. Let's look at Bowie from the Total Drama Island reboot. Now, I know what you're thinking. This twink looks like the exact kind of pandering woke first shit that the Daily Wire would make fun of for about two days before going back to promote their own bad media projects. But if you actually watch the series, you see Bowie is amazingly written. Yeah, he fits a lot of gay stereotypes, but he's also incredibly smart, hilarious, cunning, manipulative, competitive, and even caring at times. He actually feels like a real person. His design and eh, the, the pearl necklace is a little much. And his relationship with Raj. Holy shit, finally someone in total drama says, hey, let's get together after the competition. That single line could have saved how many total drama relationships? Oh yeah, he has flaws, but he works hard for what he earns. And that makes him relatable. If you take the gay away from him, I guess he's kind of still an awesome character, but it adds more to his character. You see some more sensible moments from him. Being gay plays into a big part of the plot. But this still shows that not only is being gay not his whole character, but it contributes positively to it. And of course, let's look at Hasbin Hotel. Charlie and Vaggie's relationship isn't gay for the sake of being gay. We see a normal relationship that just happens to be gay. They have a fight and have to rebuild trust. They have a good dynamic with each other and they play off of each other very well. We see and hear about how they feel about each other and it flows so well. The characters have plot, development, traits that make them interesting outside of that relationship and outside of being gay. And when that kiss does finally happen at the end, it's heart touching. It feels wholesome. It doesn't feel like it's pushing anything. It feels natural and genuine. Meanwhile, does anyone remember Gen Z when that trailer came out? The entire marketing was, look at our trans woman. This is a trans and she is a main character. All the lines in the trailer are about trans. I guess that's fine if you're making a documentary, but what else does she do? Oh, that's it? Yippee. And it sucks that for the longest time that stuff like this has tainted the thought of any diversity in media. Why do you think people instantly shy away from race bending, gender bending, and gay rep in films? It's not just because of bigotry. Part of it is because of the hollow, unbaked stuff like this that's getting greenlit to where now people just kind of expect it to be bad. They expect it to be just a passion project with someone with a connection that got greenlit not because of talent, but because they know the right people. There are amazing films that have diversity, but they aren't amazing because they have diversity. They have amazing stories, worlds, characters, messages, 
One of my goals for my upcoming book is to prove that diversity can be good and apolitical when written with love and care. And I hope that I can do that. Using art to discuss politics has been a thing since ancient times. That being said, it does not make whatever you're doing immune to cringe. In fact, it increases the likelihood of cringe by a lot. There is one key thing that can prevent your media from being cringe if you're trying to tell a political message. And this is something I see consistently amongst the places that do it wrong. And that is show, don't tell. All of the media that feels forced struggles with this badly. An example of this is the new rebooted Proud Family. This suffers badly from show don't tell. They are literally chanting their political message right at the audience. And it does come off as cringe, preachy, and lazy. Unlike in the original Proud Family, where they had an episode that showed us segregation. They showed us black history. At the beginning, Penny's very indifferent about learning about this part of history. And by the end of the episode, everyone realizes why it's so important. And that is one of the most universally agreed upon best episodes of the Proud Family for a reason. And it's because of Show Don't Tell. If I wanted to listen about somebody talking about the housing crisis, I just pull up YouTube and listen to one of the dozens of political commentators there. If I'm watching a movie or a TV show, I normally came to be entertained, not lectured to. Another example of this done well is Parasite. Do they turn to the camera and give us a lecture about economic inequality? No. They don't tell you society is unequal. They show you the difference in the living situations, the impact of the rainstorm consequences of their actions. That's why it won an award. It still has a political message. It just shows it instead of tells it. Show don't tell is hard. I still struggle with it a lot and it takes a lot of practice, but it can completely change the impact of the message you are trying to get across. A lot of times in the name of progressiveness, people end up unintentionally making media that can be insensitive, offensive, historically inaccurate, and just open up other cans of worms. Well, historical inaccuracy kind of falls flat if you're talking about fantasy or fiction, but if you're going to play into history and real world events, don't be surprised if diversity or strong female characters don't fit perfectly into your story. The Beauty and the Beast remake got a lot of backlash for various reasons, one of which was the diversity of a cast set in a small French town in the 18th century, when slavery was still a thing. Now, it's Disney, it's for kids, most people wouldn't care about them not addressing French racism if they did not hammer down on the sexism aspect. You see why this feels off and why even people on the left criticize it for being tone deaf? Yes, gays and other races existed in 18th century France. Were they treated this kindly? Absolutely not. White women who read, like Belle, would have been treated much better than that. If they said it in the late 18th century, this probably would have been fine. But Emma Watson unintentionally broadcast a message that downplayed France's history of horrific racism and homophobia, all while amplifying other historical aspects like the Great Plague of Marseille. A good example of Disney doing this is the Hunchback of Notre Dame. You see how Esmeralda and the Romani people are treated. That's how people were treated back then. And this movie helps us remember what these people went through. And still go through. While teaching us a lesson that hopefully we can be better. Imagine you were to race swap anyone in a Hunchback remake. Even a background character would make it feel incredibly off and defeat the point of the film, because one of the central themes is racism and xenophobia and judging others who are different. And that takes place in Paris, a place far more likely to be diverse than a small French town. And it's why everyone loves this movie. It's a children's movie set in a realistic place, has fantasy elements, but when it mentions the historical and cultural aspects, it keeps it accurate, which is critical for it to get its message across. So in this Beauty and the Beast remake, this is a small town that shuns those that are different. But gays and immigrants are apparently okay and are all treated well? You lose something, and it sends an unintended yet icky message. 
Frozen and the Little Mermaid are fictional kingdoms inspired by real ones. They can be whatever they want. That's absolutely fine. But then we see Moana, Mulan, and Beauty and the Beast all based off of real life places with some fantasy elements just sprinkled in. But the setting is still historical. This really cuts in your flexibility to be diverse as now you have historical and cultural pressure. While I may not care as long as you tell a good story, the fact is there are many people of different races that do. Another bad example is the recent Cleopatra documentary. I'm sorry, but did you seriously make a documentary about one of Egypt's most beloved historical figures without talking to a single Egyptian? I don't even have to go into how she doubled down trying to justify not involving Egyptians in this project. Absolute prime example of, oh, we have diversity in our cast, but not in our production crew. If you're going to put diversity in a historical setting, have a reason for it other than just to be diverse. There's ways to be both historical and diverse, but you may have to delve into some uncomfortable topics. One of my series is set in medieval Prussia. One of my favorite side characters is mixed race, but because of that, people express doubt on his noble heritage. Having diversity in a historically accurate way can make for an amazing story. If you want to avoid writing about racism and prejudice as much as possible, but still want a historically diverse setting, the Roman Empire and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania are two settings that you could use, and that I'd love to see more of. This point mostly just applies to reboots. A lot of the time, these reboots are marketed or changed in a way that kind of disses the original or insults the audience for liking the original. Looking at all of the Disney princesses that were remade, except for maybe Cinderella. To a lot of these people who grew up with these films, these princesses don't need fixing. Oh, they're just rescued by a prince. Bitch, did you watch these movies? Snow White escaped assassination, suffered abuse from her mother over her looks, and overcame death. The prince is her reward for her patience and her endurance. There's a great video on this over here that I'm going to link in the description, but especially for the time where it was the 1930s and the Great Depression, I highly recommend you watch that video. Ariel sings part of your world before meeting Prince Eric. She has always been obsessed with the land world. The prince was just the final push for her to actually go and get what she wanted, and her father destroying her stuff. This is why I love the musical so much, because the musical really emphasizes that Ariel is mostly here for the land experience, but the prince is just the icing on top of the cake. She probably wouldn't have even pursued him if it weren't for her father torching all of her stuff and Ursula swooping in. By the way, it was Ursula, the villain, of the movie that made the you don't need your voice just be pretty idea bell was always a strong straightforward woman who was judged for her appearance who met another person who was constantly judged for his appearance and shared her interest rather than just calling her weird aurora and maybe jasmine are the ones you can really argue as the damsels in distress in order to make a good remake like cinderella was you can't just swap out certain parts of the movie it's not about changing and updated what was seen as old and outdated. It's about expanding on the story. Cinderella elaborated more on the prince and Cinderella's relationship so they don't just fall in love within a day. Not replacing, expanding. They told us more about Cinderella's relationship with her father and mother and showed us more about her and her stepsisters. It doesn't change the original, but adds to it. It also raised the stakes. The prince's father is dying. It's a big political issue for the prince. And then there's also a stronger message of being patient and being kind and being the better person. They didn't change big plot elements. Things still played out in the same way, but the dialogue, the way it was done, and the aforementioned pretext gave it more weight. Pissing off the audience is also another thing that's unintentionally done in the marketing of these movies. This often comes in the form of calling people who have genuine critiques about the movie racist, sexist, etc. Are some of them? Yes. But there are also people that have valid criticism. Like, you can't say all the criticism for Velma and High Guardian Spice are just from trolls. Both were so bad that people across the political spectrum united Indy's taste for these shows. 
Also, using diversity and progressivism as an element for marketing normally does not end well. That's why Ghostbusters reboot got such a bad rap. Even though it wasn't that bad of a movie. I thought it was decent, I'd watch it again. A few cringe moments, but overall I liked it. The movie itself wasn't awful. The marketing was. The High Guardian Spice trailer was just, Oh, look at us! We're whamming! Okay, cool. What's the friggin' show about? Whamming. It just makes it look like you did checklist writing and just did diversity for the sake of diversity instead of doing something creative. If Into the Spider-Verse's trailer was just, This is Spider-Man, but he's black! Look at the black kid! Did we mention he's black? It would not have gotten the same amount of views. They didn't just race wash Spider-Man, they made a new, very beloved character. Yeah, th the difference here is night and day. This isn't rewriting a classic original and just replacing him with somebody else. It's a love letter to the original Spider-Man while expanding on the lore and opening doors to both fans new and old. The biggest issue with the modern strong female character is a lack of flaws and failure. Don't worry, men fall into this too, like Lightyear did, but it's primarily women and the primary reason why these characters feel so bland and boring. It's okay for your characters to fail. It's okay for them to make mistakes. That's what makes them human. That's what makes them relatable. Also, lol I'm quirky XD is not a flaw, but I understand why this is done. We live in a world where doing one bad thing instantly paints you as a bad person. I think a lot of it's an American thing. It will be like, oh, I love this person's work, but they gave money to a person I don't like, and now I hate them forever. Because America is a place where you can't really agree to disagree. It's often an us versus them mentality, and they're so divided that they can't even politely disagree on how to better education. And I think that kind of mentality leaks into here, affecting a lot of the protagonists. Because if these protagonists have flaws, you know some dipshit is going to come out of the woods like, Why did you make the female character struggle against the men? That's so sexist. Or, she's too feminine and too emotional, you're feeding into stereotypes. And on top of that, you want this character to sell merch. So Disney's likely worried about a character that maybe had a mercy kill someone, or did something morally gray, like sign your voice away to a witch to chase a guy, or be prejudiced against somebody. What Disney doesn't realize is that the majority of us doesn't care, and that just the minority of morally righteous critics that are like that. We didn't care when they did this to their male characters. Marlin is overprotective and overly frantic, focusing his entire world around his son. That's kind of toxic parenting, but it drives him to swim across the ocean to find Nemo and learn to be more relaxed and trusting along the way. Woody is arrogant and selfish. He is still like this up until the end of like the third movie. But do you see people being like, Oh my gosh, why would anyone like Woody? He's an arrogant piece of shit. No, he sells a lot of toys and is a beloved character. Now what about the female characters? As much as the Disney princess movies are criticized for being sexist, they're beloved for a reason. Ariel is naive and overly passionate and that's what leads her to the conflict. Mulan has to work harder than the men to be on the same level. She has to practice and use her brain to get where she needs to be so she can do later plot things. These flaws should not be removed in the remakes. Otherwise, you end up with a hollow shell of a character. Modern Disney can write good female protagonists. Moana is a bit headstrong and sometimes doesn't think before acting. While this is beneficial in situations where she has to think on her feet, it's also her downfall, like charging straight through to go around Tafiti only to get absolutely wrecked and give up on herself, needing the help of her grandmother's spirit to keep going. She gets help from others and then gives up like a normal human would. But that's not being criticized for being sexist because no love interest? The character's flaws make the plot make sense. They teach their own lessons. Removing these flaws to make them more plastic takes out what makes sense in the plot and more importantly, what makes them relatable. People will say that women are unhappier under feminism because they're being forced into doing men's things. No, 
I like doing men's things. What I don't like, and the result of some of these films on me growing up, is this expectation where I constantly have to be the best possible at whatever I'm doing in order for people to take me seriously. I can't not know something or I can't not have the ability to do something. These characters set this unreasonable, unattainable expectation of being perfect at everything. All while being cool, calm, collected. Because otherwise, as seen by a lot of these tropes, they just assume that we're some stupid girl. That was the entire archetype of like the main female lead for so many of the shows I watched as a kid. Screw the beauty standards, this is the unrealistic stuff they're talking about. I think this kind of writing is a precaution that Disney is taking because they're scared of not being progressive, worrying about making female characters too unlikable. But Moana was seen as progressive and a success, same with Frozen and Tangled. But I don't think Disney understood why it was such a success. They just took strong female protagonists with no love interest and ran with it. A few key takeaways from this video. Don't piss off the people you're trying to market to. Show, don't tell a political message. Don't do progressive for the sake of progressive. Diversity is important, not in your cast, but also in your production staff. Have a purpose to your work. If your purpose is only women or diversity or progressive values, you need to sit your ass down and come up with something more. No more remakes unless you're actually adding to it. Like Twisted, The Spider-Verse, Total Drama. If you're doing this, don't rip on the old stuff, but pay homage to it. Respect it. Remember that that old thing you're calling outdated and sexist is what got you here in the first place. Respect historical and cultural accuracy when necessary, or you risk ending up accidentally sending a message that you didn't mean to. Not everything that is called woke is even woke. And sometimes people freak out over nothing. People flip their shit over turning red in the Mario movie, and both of those ended up fine. There will always be people that will always hate something because they are genuinely racist or sexist people who never change, or they're just grifters. That is not who we are writing for. Progressive media can be good. It can be amazing, even. I'm very happy to see more diversity in media. Political media can make for a powerful and impactful message. Not every story has to be relatable to everyone. You can have a film that focuses on race, gender, LGBT-specific issues. You can do all of these and still make a great piece of media that even people who hate progressivism can enjoy. You can even inspire others and actually change minds with your message, which is what most media creators aspire to do. But there are ways to go about it where that's going to be effective, and there's ways to go about it where it's going to be cringe.